Welcome everyone to the penultimate session in our series on new business in Asia driven by climate tech and sustainability. I'm Richard Dasher, I direct the US Asia Technology Management Center, which produces this uh, series. We actually don't get paid from Stanford for doing this, by the way. Um, our mission is to bring funding into Stanford. Anyway, uh, I would like to thank the member companies of our center for the financial support that they provide to us that allow us to put on programs like this. And I also want to thank everybody who is coming in, either by Zoom or in person, uh, because this program is for you. Before we get started with uh, what we're talking about today, I want to share a slide with everybody that just came out this week. PitchBook, are you seeing the whole slide? Yeah, okay. So PitchBook does a quarterly uh, report on various things, and their report uh, that just came out on the 15th of this month was talking about how investment in decarbonization and also emissions mitigation is going in exactly the opposite direction of venture capital investments in other areas. VC has been dropping like a rock this year because people are worried about inflation and the impending downturn. But uh, as you see, between 20 and 2021, there was a huge jump in funding. The number of deals and also the amount invested in um, these two areas, decarbonization and emissions mitigation. This last note for 2022 is year to date. So they're predicting that the number will be way up here on the top right of the slide once we get all the way through December. It's likely to be even more this year than it was in 2021. So um, this is just, an interesting point that the investment community really sees great opportunities in these areas that really will have an impact on the world. Now, that slide was about venture capital. And venture capital is typically not the first funding that a startup company receives. The first funding that a startup company receives that's not from the founders' own pocket or from their family's own pockets, is uh, often from an angel investor. This is an individual who is investing their own money. A venture capital fund puts together funds from limited partners and in, is investing often insurance companies or banks or other institutions' money. Uh, so, we really need the angel investors to be involved at the early stage of getting new things off the ground. And today, I'm delighted to be able to introduce an angel investor who's had a long-term track record in Asia and also, incidentally, has a master's from Stanford in what is now management science and engineering. Mark Inkster uh, will give a slide about his own story, so I don't want to take too much of it, but among the, uh, the things he's done, he launched worldwide platforms for Yahoo back in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, he has uh, co-founded a number of uh, companies. Like a lot of angel investors, his background is as a serial entrepreneur. And uh, so, Mark is going to talk about what things look like from the perspective of an angel investor. And then our second panelist today is Mr. Siddhant Gupta. And Sid is a um, founder of a number of companies. I don't know whether to call you a serial entrepreneur or a multitasking entrepreneur, because a lot of these have been kind of going on similar technologies for different business applications that are very close to each other, including the Vayu project, which had a very fast robotic fish, and also open ocean camera, and the one that we'll spend a little more time talking about today, ClearBot, uh, which is an electric boat that um, is one of the companies that Mark is backing. So Mark is joining us from Singapore, and Sid is joining us from Hong Kong. So let me ask Mark to take the floor right now. And if you'd kind of 
share your story and how you see things right now in Asia, that would be great. Fantastic, we will do. Um, I will pull up my screens, but it's really nice to be here. Thank you, Richard, for uh, for including us. Um, I uh, I spoke to your seminar twenty ish years ago, twenty five <laughs> years ago, or whenever it was back when I was at Yahoo um, uh, doing international technology transfer to Asia, and yep. uh, you know, reflecting back on uh, on on what I've done over the years, a lot did happen in my, during the time of my master's degree at Stanford. Uh, I, back then it was called engineering management, part of what's now uh, MSC, MSNE. And I um, sort of in chapter one, when I was studying, I was very interested in all things international, uh, especially in Asia, studied Chinese in college back in the eighties and uh, first went to China in 1983. So that's almost, almost 40 years wow. ago now. Uh, and and just watched Asia change so much in uh, in that period of time, um, and then at Stanford I, I I specialized or really went deep in technology transfer to what we then called uh, uh, developing countries or emerging markets, and that is how I've spent my career one way or the other. I'm mostly focused on Asia, but global at various times, and um, a mix of of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship and always around digitization and change. Um, so chapter one was was studying uh, at Dartmouth and Stanford and uh, really building a foundation. I graduated, I really wanted to spend time in China. I graduated in June of 1989. And for those of you who remember, that's when the Tiananmen uprising happened uh, and all the jobs for Americans in China shut down. Um, so I ended up spending chapter two in Silicon Valley uh, doing um, uh, uh, doing a variety of tech jobs. So I worked for Hewlett Packard, actually with a with a Stanford professor from the uh, MSE department, who's now at the business school, a guy named Hao Li, um, and we were doing global supply chain strategy there. Um, I liked the strategy work. Went up to San Francisco, worked for Bain, um, and then the internet hit in the late '90s and. I was lucky enough to join Yahoo and get a front row seat to uh, just a super exciting time in 1999, uh, up until the crash of 2000. Um, but it was a moment when you just planted a seed and it grew, and uh, that was that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, my what I did there was I built Yahoo's websites outside of the U.S. Uh, but I really wanted to go to China, and so finally in 2003. Um, I left, I, I was at Yahoo, my last job was there was vice president of Yahoo Search in Asia. I was actually splitting my time between Asia and the US. Uh, but eBay bought a company in China called uh, Ichnet, Ichu. And so I got brought into eBay Ichnet as the chief product officer and moved my family, my young family to Shanghai for what I thought was a couple of years. And you know, that, that was 20 years ago. So um, uh, times, Things have just unfolded over here. So in the last 20 years, I've built um, built and run tech businesses in Asia, first for eBay, uh, Microsoft, I ran their Southeast Asia internet businesses, um, got recruited away to a company called Vistaprint that some of you may know, it's a mass customization company. So I moved from digitization of the media industry to digitization of printing. Um, and then joined Aegon. Aegon's a big Dutch uh, financial services company that owns Transamerica. So those of you in the Bay Area you know the Transamerica Pyramid. Uh, it's the parent company of that. And I was the chief digital officer for Asia, building um, uh, building startups, uh, doing some venture capital investing, and doing some very, very challenging digital transformation of life insurance joint ventures across Asia. Um, and uh, about about five years ago, I said, you know, it's it's really time for a new chapter. Um, and again, Stanford played a role. Stanford played a role in in many of these, uh, uh, just the people I met and just things that happened over over the years. Um, but I went to uh, a, an alumni event here that was based on a course at Stanford called Designing Your Life, and um, really enjoyed it and and took some lessons from that and. Uh, they talked about using rapid prototyping for life planning. Uh, so I did a couple different things, um, um, one of which was joining an early stage VC here called Antler as their first venture partner, just as they were getting built and helping to start um, 
an e-scooter company, which is a bit like Bird and Lime in the US or Tier, Voy and Dot in Europe, uh, which is called Beam, Beam Mobility, and got uh, both of those businesses <clears throat> going up and off the ground. Um, so really got some experience doing hands-on uh, support, uh, lots of hands-on support for startups, um, both my own and, and others, and said, all right, now, now it's time to move into the investment space. So a little less than two years ago, started Asia Sustainability Angels. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, uh, and what we do is we focus on the intersection of VC investable businesses that are early stage, but only the subset of those that are uh, also actively helping the environment. So if their business is successful, it changes things in a way that is helpful for the environment one way or the other. So we miss out on a lot of the things I otherwise would have done, e-commerce and fintech and those kinds of things. Um, but all the same principles of building companies and what it takes to build a strong business very much apply to this sector as well. Um, we're up to about 40 people now, people who come from a lot of different backgrounds, but share a passion for helping the environment and taking what we think is a uh, uh, super positive energy of entrepreneurship and applying that in directions that, that we all believe in. So collectively, we meet once a month, we invest 50 to 200K in early stage climate tech startups, uh, generally across Southeast Asia. So uh, Hong Kong, where Sedant is, is just a, um, uh, right on the edge uh, for us of, of our, uh, it's not exactly Southeast Asia, but um, that's where we are. And we've done uh, nine deals so far across mobility, food and ag tech, energy, nature-based solutions, uh, industry and circularity, and the carbon economy. Those are our half dozen areas. Um, uh, so you'll hear from ClearBot today. Um, in food and egg tech, we have a, a company that's doing um, um, uh, big data analytics and uh, IoT to get data from agriculture and figure out how to improve harvest and yield with less inputs. Uh, Full Circle is Black Soldier Fly, food biotechnology company. Okra Solar does nano grids, they're called mesh grids. Uh, Fly Oro is sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, seedling is, um, is, is uh, uh, a seaweed company. Spot Ship helps shipping brokers find low carbon routes for their ships. Uh, Centec is smart cement, it's carbon nanofibers mixed into cement, so you need much less cement uh, to grow buildings. And GATE is global AI technology using something called a flux sensor to measure gases in the uh, environment um, to see how much carbon is actually being sequestered and combining that with, um, with satellite imagery and AI to help do carbon verification for forest conservation projects. So as you can see, it's a pretty broad range of companies. And uh, for me, it's been a wonderful learning journey. Um, but it's been a, a learning journey in an area where there's quite a bit of opportunity. So Bain um, and then Tomasic, which is the uh, the state, uh, the Singapore government's uh, investment fund, uh, one of them, um, work together to, they're looking actively at the opportunities in the space. And they see a, a multi-trillion dollar investment need in, uh, in, in these areas, including at the relatively early stage. So a uh, couple hundred billion dollars uh, at um, in in the sort of the the, the early to medium uh, private equity space, and then we're looking uh, within that just at the early end of that. But we still see, especially in mobility, food and ag tech, um, and industry and circularity, a lot of opportunities at the early stage. A bit less in some of the, the more capital intensive ones. Um, uh, like energy, but there are still some early stage opportunities in those and nature-based solutions. Um, Mark, so that's me. That's that, Mark, Mark, before you leave that slide, when you say like a $50 billion opportunity or a $30 billion opportunity, are you talking about uh, like the total size of the market, the TAM for all of the companies and, and that kind no, of this, category? No, this is, this, is, this is investment needed in this space. Uh, oh, the to, to needed. To, okay. To, to green economy. Got it. Yeah. So so massive 
uh, the, the slide that you showed of all the money going in is just a, just a tip of the iceberg uh, related yeah. relative to what's needed to fundamentally change all these industries. Um, okay, so we, sorry we, to we interrupt, that, thanks. Yeah, no, we see that as an opportunity for, for the runway. Um, so I've, I've been in a bunch of venture ecosystems around the world. I spent 15, 20 years in the Bay Area, um, but also was lucky enough to be uh, somewhat apart, uh, uh, pay some attention to the European VC scene in the late 90s and early 2000s as that was growing. Uh, and then all across Asia, watching it go from Japan to Korea and Australia, uh, then China's VC scene developed and India's developed. And in the last 10 years, it's happened in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, but it really is only about a decade old in Southeast Asia. And in almost all those cases, it was the same internet adoption S-curve that you just saw play out market after market after market. And what drove that in Southeast Asia was the launch of cheap Android phones because there weren't landlines, there weren't uh, uh, internet connections in a lot of these countries, even, even as late as 2010, 11, 12, <clears throat> most people didn't have internet access. And then you got people taking uh, very inexpensive Android phones. And after I think Android launched about 2008, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, launched about 2008, and you um, uh, found that by the time 2012, 13, 14 came around, enough people had the $50 or $100 phones that suddenly it really transformed how people um, uh, communicated with each other, how people started using the internet. And that then laid the groundwork for the VC industry here, but it's new. Um, and so people started out with $10 million funds. Then 10 years later, they probably have maybe 100 to $200 million funds. Anything more than a couple hundred million is a pretty big fund for Southeast Asia. Um, but those, the, the, the people who did well in the first wave have now moved to a bit later stage. And that's left some opportunities at the early stage for angels to come in. Um, we also have more global tech companies that have built out here over the past decade. Uh, some entrepreneurs have had some exits and that keeps happening. Um, and the families uh, running big traditional businesses have spent more and more time, you know, making experimenting and learning along the way. Um, climate tech and sustainability within angel investing world is super nascent. Uh, I'd say three years ago, two, three years ago, almost none. Um, now, just in the last six to 12 months, seeing more and more. Uh, which is 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 exciting because there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, and I think that opportunity here is based largely on the characteristics of Southeast Asia, which are somewhat different from other places. So for example, uh, we have wonderful forests across uh, many countries here, but especially Indonesia and Philippines, some, some other Southeast Asian countries. Um, and so there are opportunities to do carbon sequestration there in ways that people in you know, Silicon Valley and London and Stockholm aren't necessarily thinking about. Um, the, the urbanization is happening right now in, in, in many of these companies, it's, it's countries. It's happened over the past 50 years, but it will keep happening over the next 50 years. And um, so build out of smart cities is on people's mind here. And that's very different from if you're a big Western uh, uh, or even J Japanese or Korean city that's already already been developed. Um, very tight partnerships between uh, active role of government and business in Southeast Asia. Uh, an example in Singapore, um, the Singapore wants to have 30% of its food produced locally by 2030. And so they're saying, what can we do to make sure that happens? And they're supporting, um, for example, cell grown meat here. Um, and there is no chicken lobby, there is no beef lobby uh, to, to slow that down. So um, the government can play a super important role here. Uh, and then there, there are factors that are just part of Southeast Asia that all the, um, uh, all the, that's driven the VC and entrepreneurial activity. The GDP is growing rapidly, there's a large young population, um, and the ecosystem's really, really quickly evolving. So compared to where it was 10 years ago, compared to where it was five years ago, it just it just keeps getting better. Um, so yeah, so I guess that's that's kind of it for my general comments. Um, and with that, I'll I'll pass things on to to Sid. Um, 
Uh, but, that's okay. Yeah. Mark, can I ask, uh, in introducing Sid, how did you find him? <laughs> Pardon me for saying it that way. You know what? I, <clears throat> I can't remember how we came across uh, each other. I, uh, I think I think Jen introduced us. Ah, yes, that's right. So again, just just you know, uh, common uh, common people in in this very sort of small world of people interested in climate tech in Southeast Asia. So uh, mutual, yeah, mutual friend introduced us, um, and Sid and I had a, a, a great initial conversation where um, I was a little prickly, asking him some sort of tough questions, uh, but he did a great job of responding to my prickliness. But what really impressed me, and I don't know if you'll talk about this in your slide, but um, uh, what really impressed me more than anything else was the way that Sid is building the company based very much on what his customers want. Um, so he's uh, uh, for the, uh, all the way through and in all the discussion, the, the thing that, that, that struck me was he's actively talking to his customers, thinking about what, what they need, thinking about what they don't need, looking at the technology that's out there and um, and only putting in the bits that customers are are really needing. Uh, and I think that's the core uh, of, of any good entrepreneur is really paying attention to the unmet needs and of your customers and finding ways to apply any technology you can to that. And uh, so I, frankly, I just I don't see that nearly often enough. I think I think. Uh, <laughs> You know, I think it's the core and um, and it's not always there. So when I saw that, I was impressed. Um, and I I also live near the water in Singapore. And every day I see work boats going by collecting garbage off of off of the water surface. And I would love to see that be done uh, autonomously and electrically. So with that, over to you. No, no worries. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Um, um, so, hi, I'm Sid. Just a second, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so no one's up. Well, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm Sid. I'm uh, an entrepreneur based out of Hong Kong. And uh, I basically build businesses that use robotics to drive sustainable change within industries. Right. So uh, a common theme you see across some of my work is uh, most of it is related to robotics. Uh, and a lot of it is uh, also related to water related industries, specifically ocean related stuff. Uh, and I have some pictures here of some of the projects I've worked on, uh, which Richard mentioned earlier, the robotic fish, the camera and clear bot right? So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be going through this in a little more detail, but you know, it's kind of a brief introduction. So um, I actually grew up in, in India, in Bangalore, which is, I guess, kind of where the center of the Indian startup ecosystem is, uh, as well, funny enough. And uh, I was there till 2015, and then I moved to Hong Kong in 2015. Uh, now, the reason there's a photograph of a factory in the background is actually my parents run a small manufacturing company in India. And so I spent most of my childhood very much around machines. And that really, really got me into robotics at a young age. Uh, I started building robots in India. I actually set a national record at the time, uh, building the smallest robot in India before I graduated high school. And uh, I then came to Hong Kong and I was like, okay, we've done this national record thing. So what next? And so the idea was, can we break a world record? Right. Uh, and so I sort of cheekily went up to the Guinness Book of World Records and tried to find opportunities where I could actually break a world record. And we came up uh, with this idea to build a robotic fish, right? And so um, basically the marine space is, is, is quite nascent, right? The internet revolution never really hit the marine sector in some sense, because ships underwater, you don't have that kind of communication. And so there's a lot of opportunity, right? And we saw the technology was really lagging behind and well, we could break our record potentially, right? So uh, between 2015 and uh, 2020 January, so almost almost four and a half years, uh, I worked on this project while I was doing my undergraduate university uh, work. And we actually set a Guinness World Record for building the world's fastest robotic fish in Jan of 2020. Right? So that's the fish that broke the record. Um, and as a, as a result of this, actually, I got a lot of exposure into the, the marine, at least the marine automation industry. Right, and, and it ties a lot into my, my work on the trade Um Sid, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah, what sure. What is difference between a fish and like an underwater sort of 
pardon me, propel, uh, uh, torpedo or something that goes fast, but it, you know, what's the difference between a fish and uh, a guided torpedo of some sort? Sure, great question. I mean, the, the basic difference is actually just the, the mode of propulsion, right? So if you're looking at a, a torpedo or a ROV, you're using propellers to, to control its position. Uh, and basically propellers, they're quite efficient, of course, but they're not actually as efficient as the undulating motion of a fish. Uh, and, and that's also why I guess in nature, you know, you see that as, as a motive. Uh, so, so kind of what we were trying to see is, is it possible to actually replace a propeller with uh, uh, an, an undulating uh, sort of mm -hmm. uh, fin, right? And are you able to get the same efficiency or the same sized electric motor? Uh, in fact, a higher efficiency using this. And, and what we found out is, yes, in fact, this is a lot more efficient. Right? It's just uh, a lot more difficult to build because you need to build a lot more flexibility that you need to create in the fins. And so sort of research was going on, on on that side of things. But yeah. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, uh, the next year, this is the year right after I graduated. Uh, basically, I was like, hey, I want to start my own company. And uh, I I did a lot of very weird things uh, with my life at this point. So my, my first attempt at a company was to build advertising boards. You see the little chalkboard with the screen uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, the idea being that you change ads based on who's walking past your restaurant. So if there's like a kid, you can show them a cake. If there's a, a man, you can show them a steak. I don't know if sure that's kind of the concept. Uh, terrible idea, did not work. We got barely enough traction. Uh, COVID, it was right after COVID as well. Uh, so restaurants still weren't really interested. Um, and then after that, I went to India uh, for a couple of months and uh, me and my, actually my current flatmate uh, started a app to help daily wage workers get jobs, which is surprisingly a very big problem in India. So they basically stick around these, uh, I guess you can call them like cross like signals right around traffic lights and then people pick them up for daily wage work. So we made an app uh, that would make that more, more efficient and we actually signed up about 3000 users over those three months, uh, which was quite amazing. But then my, my co-founders got jobs at JP Morgan and they left. So I was left hanging. And uh, finally, my, my, my last uh, work, this is all in the same year, sort of year and a half, a crazy time. Uh, I actually joined Entrepreneur First, which, and I didn't know Mark was actually a partner at Antler, but EF is, I guess, Antler's competitor in some sense. But I, I, was, I was part of EF, uh, and we started a company, I, I became CEO of one of their portfolio companies, and I went to Myanmar for like a year, and we were building an app that helps small businesses uh, do well track their accounts. And as a result, we will credit score them and help connect them to the banks for, for, lend, for loans, right? Um, and then, first of all, with COVID, unsecured lending became illegal in Myanmar. And then we tried to pivot to a SaaS and literally within four months, uh, there was a military coup and the, and the government was overthrown. So we decided, okay, you know, we're just getting out of here. Uh, so I came back to Hong Kong in uh, June, 2020, and I was wondering what to do. And we started building out this uh, idea me and my current co-founder had for a while, uh, which was to build these boats that collect trash out of water, right? And we'd seen this in Bali. We'd started this idea in Bali on a beach. And we saw a lot of people collecting, you know, waste out of water by hand. And when we come back to Hong Kong, we noticed that, you know, the, the government basically has a fleet of about 70 to 80 petrol and diesel powered boats here. And then you have a crew of three people who literally goes around fishing it out with a net, right? Um, and as Mark said, you know, it's the same thing in Singapore. It's the same thing if you go pretty much anywhere in the world. Problem's absolutely massive. And so we started building these boats uh, to replace out these old gasoline-powered machines. And, and while doing that, what ended up happening is we started doing not only trash collection, but, you know, a lot of other stuff. And so uh, this is kind of our product today. It's called ClearBot. We basically, it's a self-driving autonomous boat. And we replace out these old gasoline-powered machines with cheaper to operate, cleaner, greener machines. Uh, we built these in partnership with Razor, which is a sort of gaming company out of Singapore. And uh, the idea is to make a machine look very appealing. And today we're doing a number of use cases based on what our clients want. Uh, so we have a fleet of 10 boats in operation um, and we're doing pollution controls. That's cleaning out trash, that's cleaning out like seaweed and water hyacinth that grows in like lakes and rivers. Uh, we're doing foam and oil clearing about treatment plants. Uh, we can move cargo, so in goods deliveries up to 200 kilos, ship to shore, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, and also the same, it's, um, the exact same machine, by the way, does inspections and uh, surveillance, so seabed mapping and inspections in unsafe areas. Uh, so we started off doing trash cleaning and basically our clients have helped us 
say, oh, can your board also do this? Okay, we'll, we'll you know, pay you for that and kind of expand it out. Uh, and each of these use cases, we are cutting emissions at the least. So we're replacing out the board machine, uh, but also our boards generate ESG reports for our clients. So as sustainability has taken a forefront, a lot of our clients actually want ESG reporting and we've built that into our machine. So every time we go out on a mission, it actually collects data on, uh, let's say for example, for trash, how much trash it collected, what kind of trash and gives that back to our clients. Uh, so yeah, I guess that is sort of a brief Can I ask a, a follow-up question? Um, are you providing the service of picking up the trash or do you sell the boat to somebody else to, uh, for them to use in picking up the trash? That's a great question. Uh, also, funny enough, one of the first questions uh, Mast asked me, I have to remember this, <laughs> being the topic of our first meeting. Uh, but actually today we, we're doing robots as a service. That's the business model. And, and we're finding a lot of success with that because uh, what happens is, you know, most of these clients don't want, to, first of all, we're dealing with fairly risk averse clients, people like government, property companies, large corporates, right? So they don't want to buy a machine that they're afraid they can't maintain or they're not familiar with. Right, so a robust as a service works well because it's a lot less risk for them to adopt. Um, also, it's much better revenue for us, right? As we were starting off, uh, you know, if you sell it once, well, it's one time revenue, but with this, this consistent cash flow. And if you look at our value add, basically it's that we're cutting OPEX by quite a lot, right? Uh, operational expenses by quite a lot. So you have these companies that are, or the government departments that are already paying month on month. And so what we're able to do is go in and say, hey, look, I'll cut your monthly cost. And that ends up being a great revenue stream for us for as long as the boat is running, uh, while allowing them to adopt the new solution at fairly low risk. Okay. And you got the idea by watching the old style gasoline powered boat going by and scooping up garbage and thought this yes, could be absolutely. done better? It's it's absolutely hilarious. I mean, if you if you if you ever come to Hong Kong and you're out in the harbor, you'll, you'll probably see one of these machines. And so, thirty foot long sampan boat that's basically floating around trying to collect little cups or like cans that are floating across you know this giant harbor. And then you have three guys with with nets trying to fish them out. And uh, that's when and I mean the, the the point was that we realized the boats create more pollution than they were cleaning up on a, on a purely on a carbon to carbon basis. So uh, that's when we said, okay, like this is actually a very good sort of opportunity here. So at this point, is your customer probably the harbor authority itself, or is it um, is there like a recycling company that you sell the plastic to, or the the what the garbage you pick up? How does that side work? Sure. So if you look at us as a business, you know, fundamentally we're a autonomous boat business. That's, that's all we really do, right? So uh, with, with, with respect to the actual garbage, once we collect it out, there's somebody else who then handles that. So we'll either hire them or our customer will, you know, buy a, a larger sort of service package from us and somebody else handles the waste as soon as we're done. So we, our boats bring it back, some like we'll take it out and then you have a waste manager who then takes it and then actually handles the recycling. And some clients also want reporting on the recycling. So then again, our, our, our partners will pick up that waste and then recycle it and report back to our client, you know, how much, what percentage was recycled or all of that. Yeah. But we, we actually just handle the sort of both side of it. Okay. So uh, a couple of questions, one of which comes in by Zoom, and one of our uh, watchers on Zoom is asking if you're uh, also looking at microplastics, things that are not just, you know, you know big floating trash objects, but uh, is that an area of interest to you in the future if you're not doing it now? Sure. So we aren't doing that right now. We're actually focusing very much on things that are bigger than five mm. And actually, microplastics is defined as anything smaller than five mm. So, uh, so we're just above that threshold. And uh, I think in the future there is an opportunity. This uh, the actually microplastic nets available, and there is demand for this sort of thing. But I think we're still in a stage where we're proving the sort of we're doing the proving the technology, proving the market first, and and then as we scale up, I'm sure those opportunities will come up. And if I can make a comment on that, uh, certainly the Harbor Authority, the people who are responsible for the shoreline, or, you know, if you're in a place where there are resort hotels along the shore, would be quite happy to pay for things that you see. But one of the problems that we have with these big environmental problems like microplastic uh, that are throughout the ocean is figuring out who's going to pay for the, you know, the collection. 
Uh, so you've got a real customer now. That that's uh, you know this is great. Um, yeah, we're we're getting uh, lots of uh, people from uh, yeah, uh, other questions coming in. What about beach cleanup? Are you doing anything amphibious? Uh, no, we are not. So I think uh, again, basically our focus is. Uh, you might say it's quite limited, uh, but the idea is actually to stay quite focused, right, on what at least adding value to the customers that we are. So uh, we don't do, I mean, we might support a beach cleanup more as a as a fun thing for our team or like, you know, just that. Uh, but uh, yeah. primarily, actually, our work is based mostly off the shorelines. So that's government projects. It's based in marine construction projects. That's a big clientele of ours. So during marine construction, a lot of waste is generated. They need to manage that. Um, and um, also property companies. So as you said, Richard, we have we have some hotels or some marinas. Uh, there's basically property by the water, and then they want to take care of it. So, so, so beach cleanups are more of sort of fun activity, but we're really focused on uh, existing customers. Okay. So, a few questions about the performance of the boats. Your boats are electric, and so I guess they're plug in. At the end of the day, you just put them into the power grid and and charge them overnight, or what? What do you do? Uh, great question. Yes, absolutely. So you can, we have a, a 220 volt, well, that's what they use in Asia anyway. So 220 volt uh, charging port. So you literally plug in um, the charger in and it charges overnight. Uh, alternatively, actually, we have, we just launched a solar dock. So uh, so you can actually have the solar panel charge a set of batteries on land. And then as the boat comes back, it can charges with that. And so uh, the idea is that we're able to then reduce the, the net emissions, right? The indirect okay. emissions as well. That's great. And the current boats look good for sort of harbor size, but they're not that big. How much trash can you get in a day? Sure. We can pick up about 200 kilos on our boats. Uh, so they are actually, uh, funny enough, they're actually competitive to the 30 foot some pounds, right? Because uh -huh. uh, what happens is on a larger boat, you need to have pretty much sounds funny, but basically more space to have humans on board. And so it needs to be a lot more stable. It needs to be a, a the, the class system gets a lot more complex. Uh, but with these with unmanned machines, you can actually size down and use almost all the available space. So, so yeah. at this point, you you we've talked a lot about sort of solid garbage. Have you already moved into the boats that will like help clean up oil spills or uh, that kind of you know? other kind of material. Are you already in that space or is that a space you're moving into now? What's the situation? Sure, so with oil spills specifically, I mean, well, to answer your question, the answer is yes, we have actually started a lot of other use cases already. Uh, so two of the very popular ones we see, the first is invasive species. So that's like your water hyacinth growing on the lakes. So you've seen those lakes just covered in green algae or hyacinth, right? So we've just got projects from the Hong Kong government as well as sort of inquiries in India for those kind of projects. Uh, actually, we just we got a bunch of inquiries from Florida recently to do the same thing when they have this problem. So uh, that's one area in waste species. Uh, the second is oil. So oil, we're doing very small scale. Uh, we're doing basically uh, oil cleaning for marinas or for the government on the or on ports. Right? So you're not, you're, not, you're not talking BP oil spill, we're talking okay. you know, ship, okay. ship oil leak. <laughs> that's the scale we're at. Uh, but we so already have that. Gets us, this kind of gets us into your overall mission and vision for the future. Um, if would you mind putting up your last slide again, the one that has oh, sure. the, the mentions in the media and what kind of partnerships you have? Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about this. You're saying you've got partners with these companies, and you've been mentioned in the media, and you've got a list of clients. If you'd give a few more details about your partnerships, that would be great. Awesome. So one of my favorite experiences or good experiences running a sustainable business, a relative sustainability related business, is a lot of people are able to help you out without having to be worried about it. Right. And there's a lot of people who genuinely care about your mission and what you're doing. Right. Uh, so I'll just take a few examples. Let's, let's say Razor and Microsoft, right? So those are companies that probably most people would know. Um, and so we, we did a partnership with Razor last year. We met them at CES, uh, 
which is you know Philosopher Fair in the US. But at the time it was virtual. That's how we were there. And uh, we met the, the CEO of Razor there, and uh, we managed to get a ten minute call with him and convince him that hey, look, what we're doing is really good right so we need to design a new boat because our boat is terrible so can you help us do that and so Reza actually did a partnership with us where uh, we they helped us design our entire the outside of the boat uh, and in return we write actually clear boat design by Reza on the current model of the boat right and so they get a marketing return while we actually were able to fund our very first boat uh, as well as get a very good looking design that then helps drive customer appeal uh, and similarly with Microsoft uh, again they the sustainability department wanted to make some kind of impact, uh, but they wanted to tie it into their existing product. Right? So then we took Azure and then we took a bunch of cloud credits from them. And then we were able to train our machine learning models on them and save a lot of cost for us. Uh, but also then they're able to tell that story that, hey, look, you know, a startup was able to use Azure, train our machine learning models with basically very little money. And then they actually use us as a use case for their own marketing and for their own sales, right? Um, and so I think being in sustainability, what's exciting is that, uh, especially you know, as that graph showed, the, the ESG interest, the sustainability interest has really peaked uh, over the last few years, it's really grown. And uh, a lot of these companies are just looking to work with startups that are doing good, right? And they're, they're, they're willing to make the effort to figure out how to work with you, which is quite right. Okay. And are you actually located in the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park? I recognize HKSTP. Yes, absolutely. I don't think anyone would certainly cover that. But uh, yes, we are actually located in the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park. Absolutely. So this kind of takes me into uh, a question for Mark. Uh, Mark, there's a lot of water between uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, when you're doing investments over such a broad area, geographic area how do you keep up with what your companies are doing yeah it's a great question and super hard um I, I do remember back you know 20 years ago 25 years ago in san francisco you could have uh, vc funds that were specializing in china and india and 25 years ago you could do that from san francisco um you know and then even in the early 2000s the mid sort of 2005 time there were china and india funds um, and you know you could do China and India together and be in Hong Kong or something like that. Um, you know, and then you could only do China from China. Then you could only do India from India. Uh, what's happening in Southeast Asia right now in the VC ecosystem is uh, it all used to be here in Singapore, and now increasingly people have offices in Jakarta, uh, offices in Vietnam. Um, and it's becoming more and more country specific, and that's just the way the industry is you have to be near entrepreneurs so it is super hard uh to to be sitting here in singapore and um and and trying to do due diligence on companies far away um and that's a structural problem in this region but there aren't all that many early stage climate tech companies out there yet and so you have to cast a net relatively broadly um we rely on there's a lot that you can do with zoom and uh you know and looking at data rooms so uh you can um uh, we're all now used to uh, used to these tools after the pandemic and i think there are plenty of people who do a fair amount of dd with zoom and and have done you know deals didn't stop when when the world locked down so we rely on all those things um also it's um uh we hope to find co-investors and in this case, uh, Gobi was a, a, an institutional investor in, uh, uh, in Clearbox. We had a good conversation with Gobi and, uh, and, and understood their rationale and how close their rationale was to our rationale. Um, so that's important. Um, you know, and, and, and finally, at the end of the day, um, there's so much risk in any early stage, super early stage, seed stage investment, um, that a lot comes down to what do you believe about the team and what do you believe about the area in which they're playing? And I mean, a floating drone instead of a flying drone, you know, is, is, is certainly an opportunity. Okay. Um, I also, before, before we move on, I have another question from me. And that is about how you prepare the companies for follow-on investment. 
Are you trying to help them reach investors outside Asia, particularly, or are you, um, you know, is there enough money inside Asia for you to kind of lead them into the next round or help them get a, a round with the, you know, a bigger round for Series A or Series B? Um, it depends on the company itself, but broadly speaking, um, there is global interest in these companies because there's global they're solving global problems if you're if the problem you're solving is a last mile delivery in indonesia which is a hard problem to solve it's not necessarily that interesting to a copenhagen based investor but if what you're saving if, if what you're doing is carbon sequestration in the rainforests of of, of sumatra um, or Borneo, then that actually is interesting to a lot of investors outside of, uh, of this part of the world. So, uh, and then secondly, some of this, some of this is not necessarily interesting to investors in this part of the world. There still is so much uh, opportunity in kind of web one, two, three, it's all being built here in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And so, um, um, some, some of the companies that we're finding are finding interested investors outside uh, there. Now, in terms of what we do, I, I think we can um, we can help people, we can help entrepreneurs understand what investors look at. In fact, on Monday, I have a call with somebody on Sid's team uh, to talk about well, what what did we look at, and how does that how does that play into their next round, and what do I think the next round is going to look at? So that's a very specific example. Um, we have another investment. I talked about the Black Soldier Fly biotechnology company that we're, we invested in up in Thailand. Um, we got we helped get them hooked up with a um, European-based incubator, and uh, so the the accelerator. So the CEO just spent a couple of months up in Scandinavia working at that uh, at that accelerator, and that opened his eyes into. Uh, all the investors in Europe who are very focused on sustainability type topics and um, and, and will help them tap in. Uh, a third one was a, com a company that's mostly in Africa at this stage. It started in Cambodia, but now it's mostly in Africa doing nano grid, uh, uh, electrical grids. And um, uh, they are raising around right now. And so we've connected them to investors that we know. So it's partly a little bit of polish, um, uh, with the with the if some, some I have a structured a we as a group have structured conversations with some companies where like once a month we'll talk to the CEO. In other cases, it's much more unstructured. Okay, one more from me. Um, would you say that this sector has any particular kind of needs for hands-on relationships with the investors um, compared to? early stage companies in general, are you finding any things that uh, are related to this sort of climate tech or sustainability that really you find that there's a real need for a lot of input from the investor side? I don't, I don't think it's that different in terms of what investors okay. need. Because investors need to look at the same sort of metrics, you know, is, is the company getting traction in its core business? Are they finding clients? Are they closing, you know, sales? Uh, do they have money in the bank? Uh, are they, are, are, you know, all the, all the financial metrics? Uh, are they building a good team? Um, but if I had the same, if we had the same nine company portfolio across the same geographic reach, and it was all in, you know, e-commerce or online media um, or, or anything else, I think our engagement would be about the same. One big difference of most of the climate tech stuff we're doing is that in, it involves the real world. So a yeah. lot of online companies don't are pretty virtual. But you know, so yesterday I was talking to um, let's see if I can get that to focus. There we go uh, uh, to a company that makes straws based on uh, broken rice. They take a kind of unusable broken rice grain and they figure out how to make it in a process. They can make straws that are really uh, easily decomposable and they're selling them into Europe. But you actually have to pick up and feel the straw. Uh, and they'll, they're making other things too. And you have to pick those up and feel them. So in that sense, 
that kind of physical interaction is is important. Uh huh. That makes good sense. Uh, we've got a question from the audience, and for everybody in the audience, if you have a question, be ready. Raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks for your uh, talk. Um, quick question. Uh, I guess maybe one very specific uh, question for you. I guess in the specific context, and maybe a general question. Well, the specific question is all these, I guess, these big boats or the trawlers or whatever, they, the current system that they're using to clean. I mean, when they find your boats, like, don't, like, don't, I mean, how easy is it is for them to sort of copy, you know, your design and, and sort of be your competition? Like, what do you, I mean, what do you see in terms of that um, coming from them, for example? And maybe this is a broader question as to like, you know, these, uh, I guess some of these uh, areas that I guess, Mark, you're investing in, um, they, they're probably entrenched players there already. Is it that in Southeast Asia or, you know, or in any, in, or in any area, the, the companies are not, you know, they don't, are not interested in eco-friendly uh, ideas that these new entrepreneurs are coming up? Or is it, is it because they don't have the technology? I mean, what is the, what is the reason why bigger companies are not able to come up with ideas in terms of entrepreneurs, not necessarily entrepreneurs? Okay, two great questions. First one goes to Sid. How, how do you keep people from copying you, especially if they're large, old companies? And Mark, in, in terms of, uh, let's see, what was your question for Mark again? It was, um, I, I'm blanking. So, sort, of, sort, of, sort of general, in a general sense, um, how, how are bigger companies looking at the eco space? Right. Like and how, how do you find things that the bigger companies are not all over already? Yes. Great. Sid? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for that question. So, uh, okay, let's start with the so the existing players, right? So, I mean, these guys are, to be honest with you, doing pretty well. And in, in their view, they don't want to take the risk of being the first people to try to do what we're doing anyway, right? So uh, I think that is step one, which is the way they see it, the status quo is good for them, right? And they're not actually looking to, to make a change very quickly. Uh, the second side is, okay, how do we then prevent them from getting into this space as we start getting traction? And honestly, I think uh, what we've seen is, so the technology we're building is is fairly complex, right? Um, and, it, you know, it, it it's something that was built previously only for military applications, right? The military was the only people investing in building this kind of stuff. So, um, first of all, most of the existing companies who have this technology work with the military. Most of them aren't actually sell in the commercial market. Uh, now, there are about four or five companies, in fact, probably a little bit more, that are now doing this commercially like us. Uh, and in that case, the way I see it is that, you know, the market's big enough really for everybody at the moment anyway. It's about moving quick and really proving, proving the product. Um, and eventually, I think, you know, this is a space where, so for example, we have a patent register that, of course, uh, makes it more difficult to, to actually copy some of the core elements of what we're doing. Uh, but then again, this is a space where the technology is moving every three years, right? So every three years, the technology gets better and everyone moves to whatever is the newest uh, sort of thing. So it's not a space where, to be honest, these old companies can really compete. Uh, you have to move very quickly. You have to have the right talent. You have to attract uh, the right talent. And I think they really struggle at doing that. So uh, what they're good at is building the actual boats, getting the tenders from the government, right? Like they know how to do that stuff really well. And they will continue to do that really well. And so what I'm seeing actually in the industry is a lot of acquisition or uh, sort of investment-based approach. So at least a lot of the old companies in China, a lot of them are just straight up buying out a lot of these startups or they're investing a ticket into some startup so that uh, as this technology matures, they're able to include it into their operations rather than try and build it themselves. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, Mark? What about what about your question about the big companies? Why aren't they all over this space? You know, I think um, um, it's really the same as corporate innovation anywhere. Uh, I, I am seeing more and more good quality corporate innovation in startups uh, happening. There's a, a whole industry. I'm actually involved with a Silicon Valley company called Mach 49, doing a little consulting for them that, that helps corporates innovate. Um, it's a hard problem. I was I was chief digital officer at a life insurance company, and um, you know, uh, trying trying to get the concept of move fast, break things into uh, a company whose whole 
ethos is take care of this money and these people for 30 years. Uh, those ideas don't always, always mesh together. So it's, it, I've been there on the front lines in a bunch of situations and it's super, it's hard, but, but the world's getting better at it. And a lot of, you know, the, some, uh, I started my career at Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard was great at it. Uh, so there are some companies that are doing it well. What we're seeing in Southeast Asia is um, there are not a lot of, of big corporates who are focusing on many of these problems. There are some corporates who are setting up innovation labs, um, you know, incubators and accelerators and uh, venture building operations and, and all that. So, th so that's starting. Um, I, I think there's probably more opportunities for partnerships. Um, and then lastly, I would say there's a lot of these companies and, and, and ClearBot is one of them that will require massive capital investment to scale. And big corporates have a, a lot of, of capital potentially and the ability to do things at a big scale. So I, I do think there's really rich ground for taking these ideas once proven and collaborating with, uh, with corporates. And, and I, I see that as a more likely model than the corporates actually doing the work that Sid's done so far to go from zero to one. Yeah, it's very often the case that a startup company is looking at, an, a, mark, at a market that is so much emerging that besides the technology risk, there's very high market risk. And so the big companies are all closer into supporting their existing business. But as the company is successful and grows, they definitely become acquisition targets. Uh, I'm kind of taking companies in random order now. Uh, I, questions in random order, I mean. On Zoom, we had a question about uh, UAV companies, un, unmanned autonomous vehicles, right? in oil and gas and cleanup in those areas, are, are companies like that looking at possibly making acquisitions? Has anybody offered to acquire you yet, Sid? None of the UAV companies. We had a, we had a very, very weird sort of acquisition offer about a year ago uh, from, uh, I guess, an investment bank in Hong Kong. But I think I think they just wanted something on their ESG portfolio that would be desperate. So. Uh, but okay. no, at the moment, I think I think uh, I think the West are very small, and uh, you know most of these companies are definitely looking for something more mature, something more established before they uh, get serious about something like acquisition. So let me offer best wishes for growing as much as possible before you go to exit. Um, for uh, Mark. Uh, how do you see the situation with the role of governments in, in Southeast Asia in regard to ESG? Are, uh, is there much uh, financial assistance that may kind of help leverage the investments? Are there many, um, you know, is there regulatory kind of frameworks that are favorable? One thing for everybody in the meeting this is, you know, Southeast Asia is a huge market, but the different countries are all very different, right, from huge differences from the different nations inside the EU, for example, right? So different political systems and so forth. So, Mark, how do you see the landscape for what governments are doing down there? Yeah, and to build on what you just said, 700 million people in Southeast Asia uh, you know, a place like Indonesia is almost as big as the U.S. in terms of its population. It's 250 million people, so not quite as big, but same order of magnitude. Um, and so, uh, but Indonesia is very different from Vietnam. Uh, that's very different from Burma, Myanmar. That's very different from Singapore. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I think the EU, the complexity of the EU is the right kind of a lens to think about the complexity of Southeast Asia. I would I'd say more... Um, more religious and cultural diversity here in Southeast Asia, maybe, and so so less cultural unity. Um, so it is a country, it is a country specific um, uh, topic. Although there are organizations like ASEAN, which are across the region and looking at this globally, uh, globally regionally, the uh, role of governments is super important in the space to provide incentives. Uh, it might it may be financial and it may be regulatory. Those are the the biggest two. Um, again, I was just talking about the straws a few minutes ago. Europe now has banned single-use plastic for a lot of 
not fast food containers. Um, Southeast Asia hasn't. Um, if Southeast Asia were to do that, that would create massive uh, change. So, uh, so the role of government uh, regulation is, is super important. Um, and then on the incentive side, uh, the Singapore government has done a great job of supporting the entrepreneurial ecosystem here. They really kicked off the venture capital industry, for example. They, they, um, there were a half dozen $10 million funds a decade ago where the government put in, I think, seven um, and, and only wanted their money back with a little bit of interest uh, and, and gave the upside to the founding team. It was an amazing deal, but that kickstarted the whole industry. And uh, they're supporting food tech here. Um, they're, and then at a broader level, there's, uh, I would add in universities. So you got the government, you have the universities, you have the corporates, you have the private capital world. And in climate tech, there, it's all super important to, to weave these things together because it's in order to make fundamental change happen, you have to somehow change the incentive structures. Um, and then each country is approaching it differently. Um, I was heartened that at uh, COP27, uh, there's a deal uh, with, with Indonesia to sort of phase out its coal industry. So I think, I think Indonesia is getting ramping up more and more on uh, climate tech, which is great to see. And um, um, I think you'll see more of that in the region. Okay, thank you. I uh, have a similar question as I'm, I'm going to read the one from Zoom first, but if somebody has a question in the audience, please raise your hand and, and let Brianna give you a mic. Um, so the question really has to do with measuring the ESG impact. And of course, at the very early stages of a company, it's hard to have anything that's really an, you know, an accurate kind of high resolution measure, whether it's the company's market potential or the size of the ultimate size of the market or anything. But Mark, how do you look at the ESG factors when you're trying to decide on whether a company is worth investing in? So for us, it's much more the E than the S and the G. The G is basic, uh, you know, and, and you have to have the, yeah. the, the basics. Although young companies often don't have the perfect corporate structure. Sometimes that gets cleaned up a bit on the way. Um, the E and the S definitely go together, but already looking at the breadth of things we invest in across E, um, we didn't feel that we could also invest in things that have a theme like education or women's empowerment or financial inclusion all super important topics, but we had to, to pick some. So starting point is that we focus on E. Second piece is that um, uh, we really want to make sure that the company by being successful solves an E, an environmental problem. So it's not that it's a bolt on, but if you look at Sid's business, if he can get to 100,000 work boats around the world, that's 100,000 uh, 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 internal combustion engines that are gone, and so mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't know if he's going to get a hundred thousand or ten thousand or a thousand or you know, but I'm I'm, I'm hoping uh, that he's going to get really big and have a big impact. And at this early stage, what I, what I really want to know is is he building the business in a way that's going to make it successful so that it can deliver that mission. That's much more important than measuring the exact amount of carbon that uh, is being removed. You know, so, okay, yeah, here's how much of uh, uh, If you get rid of that, here's how much uh, uh, that saved. And then I can sort of do a back of the envelope calculation to make sure it's a big enough contribution to the problem that it's worth investing in. Um, but that's the level that I think is appropriate for early stage. Uh, I don't think I should be making Sid spend, you know, pull an all-nighter to fill out a detailed ESG report card for me, because um, I think it's the, the wrong way for him to spend time. Just go to the heart of the problem. It's close enough. You're going to move things and make things happen at that level. Okay, that's extremely well said. Thank you. Um, I would um, like to open the floor to questions. We have any questions from the audience here? If not, we had a question some time ago on Zoom. Um, Sid, so your partnership with Razor, Razor is the gaming company, right? 
And Correct. so yeah. did it have to do with something in navigation or what kind of um, what kind of uh, situation or, or, or what kind of partnership was it? Sure, it was actually from from their side it was purely a design partnership. So their uh, design team worked with us. Uh, so well, the story is we had a old version of the boat. I unfortunately don't have a picture of it on the slides here, but uh, this old version of the boat, if I had to visualize it, looked like a bathtub with a barge behind it. Okay, it was pretty bad looking, but it worked. It, it, that's what the POC version versus the you know for public Absolutely. consumption version. <laughs> Exactly right. So, so we were we had this the, the tub version, and we were looking to to do a design upgrade. And uh, coincidentally, we met Razor CEO at the same time, and so that's when we pitched him. That, hey, look! So if you look at Razor, right? I, I know they build hardware, but if you fundamentally look at their brand value, they're just really good at designing stuff. Like the people, uh, if you look at Razor, people who like Razor, they love Razor's design, right? They've kind of defined that gaming black and green. Uh, design almost almost cultish following right uh, and so we actually love that about razor and we want to have that for our own product so we, we spoke to the ceo and we're like okay can we actually do a design partnership together so cutting a long story short they actually designed the outer shape of the boat um, and, and we actually did all the hardware ourselves but we actually got some support from them in terms of connecting with manufacturers um, and sort of understanding how to build the product itself um, as well so and 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 for them you know what's what's the return honestly is with marketing right and so uh, it wasn't even that blaming on any credits in terms of carbon or anything literally just saying that raises supporting awesome startups and then a uh, bit on internally for their for their marketing teams you know uh, as an activity at hr uh, they feel happy about it so that yeah. was kind of the partnership with them said remind the the audience about the uh, solar panel that you have just started, the kind of solar charging station. This is something you all designed or you're just buying off the shelf from somebody? Uh, well, the, the panels are off the shelf. The 90% of the solar panel systems off the shelf. There's nothing to innovate there really. Uh, I think the, the part we're innovating now is kind of the self docking and charging. So uh, how do you get the machine to come in and then the solar panel automatically charges up the boat right without someone having to do that so uh, that is the stage that we're innovating but actually we're just buying more or less ready-made readily assembled solar panels and then we're sticking them onto a docking station and we're able to help uh, and, and, and by the way this is not across all our sites because solar is not as reliable as you think uh, so we we do always have Especially a backup, in southeast uh, asia yeah yeah like it can, it can be cloudy here sometimes and you will just not have enough power so you, uh, so we always back that up with mains, but uh, but yes, we do have a solar system. It does actually work. It's already in operation. Okay. Um, are you going to make the boats by yourself, or are you going to outsource manufacturing at some point? How do you see your growth pattern? We've actually already outsourced manufacturing. So just this week was we finished our first fully assembled uh, boat in India. So the boat was completely uh, assembled out at a factory in India, and zero percent of that assembly was done in house. And so uh, we currently actually have a capacity of about twenty four boats a year, right? Two boats a month that we can already do. And uh, as as we need it, we're able to actually scale that up by working with the right partners. So. Working with the customer. That's a great, that's also a very important answer. Thank you. Um, with regard to the vision of how you see the meaning of Southeast Asia kind of environment and sustainability related um, startup innovation and the relationship with the US, especially, and this is can be for both or either of you. Uh, is, um, you know, how do you see this situation? Uh, do you think Americans are missing opportunities by not paying more attention to uh, Asia? Or is this something where you feel like the integration is going well already? Mark, let me ask you first. This is a, a, a great question and a topic as an American that's on my mind, an American living in Southeast Asia. Um, Singapore and Southeast Asia more broadly is at a super interesting nexus, environmental uh, world aside, of um, being kind of halfway between China and India, 
um, and also having a strong set of ties to America and Europe. Uh, so it's really, in many ways, connected to all the uh, all the important uh, uh, economic and political forces that are going to be shaping the next 50 to 100 years. And uh, I, I believe that um, uh, that creates enormous opportunities for Southeast Asia, uh, just as you know, I, I, I do think in, in the Vietnam War, a lot of Americans paid more attention to Southeast Asia than they might have at other times in Southeast Asia's history. Um, I, I certainly hope that there's not war in this part of the world, but I do think that there will be competing geopolitical interests who want to um, uh, exert influence in this part of the world and will do that, um, at least part of it will be in helpful ways. And uh, so financially, technology transfer, uh, support of entrepreneurship, support of other things. Um, specifically in the environmental space, um, there are characteristics you know, like the, the amount of forest land in Indonesia that ought to be preserved. And, um, and there are just a, a lot, uh, hundreds of millions of smart young people here who are emerging onto the world stage, who are uh, going to build businesses for themselves that are gonna be connected. They'll have access to the world's knowledge, access to the world's technology. Um, so I do see an opportunity for a lot of entrepreneurship to be coming out of this region. Um, I don't spend very much time in America these days, but I do find that America is not very aware of Southeast Asia. You know, people ask me, you know, what part of China is Singapore in? And, uh, uh, and that's, that's just because it's not on the radar screen. Uh, so I, I do think there's a missed opportunity. Um, but the flip side of that is I think there's a create, it creates an opportunity for people who are on the ground here. And I said, I don't know if you share any of those thoughts or if you have other ones. I don't think I'm well equipped to answer this this question, but uh, I, I will only add that you know the one thing I've seen is uh, with the, the U.S. And, and China's tensions growing. I mean, uh, for us, for example, literally we had our chip supply stop because of some recent issues, uh, and I'm seeing Southeast Asia take over a lot of that advanced manufacturing opportunity, right? So solar panels used to come exclusively from China, and now we buy from Malaysia, right? I'm just a just an example. So I think. I think that's one area I see that, at least with the US, uh, with increasing tension with China, Southeast Asia potentially uh, is one of those places where a lot of that trade and business can go. Sid, um, what are the most attractive markets outside where you are already? Is Europe the, most, the next most attractive market because of the kind of intense environmental uh, sensitivity of people there? Or is you know the North American market really interesting? What, how do you see things outside where you are now? That's a great question. So for us, you know, the short term story is very much Asia. Uh, short term being the next three, three to four years at least. So you can be as well. in Asia a while. Yeah. 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 So we, we're starting of off in there. India. Correct. So we're starting off in India. We've got our first two boats there already. And I think India itself is a humongous market, right? Uh, and then we're looking at Southeast Asia next after that. Uh, but also, I mean, you know, it, just in terms of inbound inquiries, right, where I see the demand honestly is North America. Because in 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 Europe, uh, although there is a huge amount of demand, and I think deep, literally every single citizen there is aware of you know, what's happening, and there's, there's a lot more uh, sort of passion around the issue. Uh, there's also a lot more competition. So uh, most of our competitors are European companies based out of Norway or, or Amsterdam, something like that, or Rotterdam, something like that. So uh, as a result, yes, there's more interest, but it's a much smaller market and there's a lot more competition, right? Okay. Uh, Asia, North America are like open game right now. So the, the market's huge. Uh, there's relatively very few players. Uh, and in, at least in Asia and North America, again, most of the existing companies have been in the military space. So they're quite restricted. Whoever has this technology mm -hmm. is at the moment quite restricted. So I think there's a larger opportunity in these two areas. Yeah. So uh, there's another question for you from Zoom. And this has to do with the fact that using your autonomous boats for uh, cleanup of garbage in the ocean means that people are engaged in the activity of throwing things away in the ocean that really they shouldn't be doing. Um, do you think that you have, you know, will it, do you ultimately see an, 
no need for your votes? Or do you want to encourage, do you see yourself as having a responsibility to try to encourage people not to throw so much garbage out? How does how do how do you handle that kind of situation? Sure, sure. So this is a great question. Actually, this is something we we sort of tackled very early on as we started the company. Is we uh, we realized that trash cleaning. I mean, trash cleaning hopefully stays as a temporary problem. And so you look at even my slides today. I spoke about how we're doing pollution control, like invasive species. That's like something that's very annual that happens everywhere in the world. We're moving to different use cases. And that's why we're trying to build very focus a self-driving boat company and not a, a, a marine trash management company. Right? Uh, so, so uh, for us, first of all, in terms of a business, there is very much that focus of saying this is not what we do. Yeah, we're a self-driving boat company. Uh, now, on the second side, in terms of the actual trash itself, get getting into the water and the responsibility of that. Right. So, uh, that's where the data story becomes really important. Right. So, if you look at what's happening with the ESG. Or ESG data that our boats are generating, right? All this information around what kind of waste where was it collected, what kind of material is it made of. Now, all of that's, that's really useful because you're collecting, right? You're collecting correct. this information. Yeah. Correct. So every time our machines go out in the water, uh, they're actually literally generating that information based on what we collect, right? Uh, and they're sending out reports to our clients. And so for a lot of government departments, I mean, we, for example, we work with the drainage department of Hong Kong, right? And so they're actually able to then map out uh, where the leakage points are based on the trash data that we're getting and uh, for example recently we were approached by uh, the environmental department and they're trying to create some policy around waste like in terms of materials right and restrict certain kinds of materials uh, and again they need data to actually justify putting those policies in place and so having data from literally saying you know xyz materials ends up in the water pollutes our, our harbor uh, helps them go back and actually make those make sort of justify those policy decisions right so um, in terms of, uh, yeah, so to answer your question, yes, we have a responsibility. The data side actually is hopefully adding value to the longer term uh, prevention of this issue on, on land. Uh, but then as a business, we focus on the self-driving boat aspect, which is itself a huge market. We don't really have to worry about us being a trash cleaning business. Okay. Mark, uh, your uh, slide about the areas that Asia sustainability interest, uh, Asia sustainability angels are interested in. I don't really remember alternative fuels being part of that. Was it or not? So broadly, energy is. So solar, wind, uh, energy storage, uh, biofuels. Uh, so we, we did do okay. one investment in, um, uh, in, in sustainable aviation fuel. Um, it's actually a company that is uh, mixing uh, mixing natural fuels with the conventional fuels at different levels uh, for, for different airlines who have, have different needs. Um, uh, there's a big hydrogen push across different parts of Asia. Um, a lot of that is being done by big companies and uh, it's, it's, it's extremely capital intensive. Uh, so uh, there's we're seeing less uh, entrepreneurial activities that are kind of, you know, Fifty thousand or two hundred thousand dollar checks make a difference in the business uh, for for hydrogen for green hydrogen at, at this point. Um, we have looked at waste to energy, so there's a lot of agricultural waste. There's a lot of food processing waste, and uh, uh, so we've looked at a couple of companies. Haven't made any investment yet, but that's an area of interest. Um, so th those are some examples. Um, we're looking at a company now that uh, we're looking at a solar company. Their model. Is to, is, is to solve the housing problem and the energy problem at the same time. So they're putting up a solar farm and then building houses underneath the solar panels. Uh, it's a clever, it's a, it's a clever idea. Um, uh, so so uh, those are some of the kinds of things we look at. Okay, that's great. I want to thank both of you for really great discussion today, as well as really interesting presentation about what you're doing. Um, Hats off. One of our uh, Zoom people says, fantastic that you're helping local governments regulate and eradicate the trash. Well done, Sid. So agreed. I think that there's a lot to watch your companies for. Mark, there's a lot to watch what uh, your investment group is doing. Thanks very much for sharing the situation today with us. So we'll call an end to the session today. And uh, 
for everybody here and on Zoom, our next meeting will be December 1, because next week is Thanksgiving in the US. And so we'll have our closing keynote session with uh, the founder of the POP movement, the Protect Our Planet movement. And I'm sure that Ash, Dr. Pachauri, will have a very inspiring presentation. So we'll talk to everyone then. For now, thanks so much. Right. Thank you for including us. Okay, Thank we'll you. call an end to today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.